Welcome back. Chapter 3, It's a Mistake. I'm Neil Gilfillan, the author. I swear, I swear they're out there. I swear, maybe angels. Cheryl Crow. Human beings were insufficiently mature enough to bump into beings of other civilizations. They had a long history of problems bumping into other humans. Whatever made them think they should try expanding their skills into the galactic neighborhood is anyone's guess. But they did. The Soviet Union had worked to drop a probe onto the surface of Mars since the early 1970s. Their first effort crashed onto the Red Planet in November 1971. Their second disaster landed only five days later. A further littering offense was committed in early 1974. Between February and March, two of four missions resulted in more junk that bore the Soviet Union's coat of arms. These missions were launched for the express purpose of exploring Mars before the United States did. They tried again in 1988 and 1989 leaving more debris, but this time in orbit and on the Martian moon Phobos. Not known for being quitters, except for the time when they abandoned their entire political philosophy, Russia launched yet another rocket in that left a really nasty field of garbage on the Martian face. As if to say, let us have some fun, NASA landed a successful Martian rover on July 4, 1997. It was called Sojourner. Everybody was pretty happy about America's coup except the Soviet Union, who at first prof professed they hadn't noticed. Actually, it was possible Russia's president hadn't noticed. Boris Yeltsin had tired of coups and taken up tennis instead. He'd also taken up drinking a shot of vodka for every missed point, and Yeltsin missed a lot of points. He also drank shots of vodka with meals, after a hard day's laying around, and almost any time he was awake. Sojourner performed its mission very well. It exceeded life expectancy and mission goals by over two months. Final contact was on September 27, 1997 and Boris Yeltsin eulogized it by downing an entire pint of Stolignaya. So what, Jerner? he asked before hitting the floor. <laughs> In January of 2004, Spirit and Opportunity began their explorations on opposite sides of Mars. Spirit survived over 11 times its mission length. Opportunity lasted well over 10. Her launch patch featured a prominent picture of Daffy Duck, a.k.a. Duck Dodgers in the 21st and a half century. NASA's mission teams loved cartoons. They had named three rocks founded by Sojourner, Barnacle Bill, Yogi, and Scooby-Doo. The last one ran away after Sojourner's cameras turned its attention elsewhere. Scooby turned out to be the accidentally acquired pet of a tall, scraggly, bulbous being from Kiros, whose ride had mechanical problems and landed some distance away. Unable to fix his problems, the being sent an emergency signal. Ambroise didn't have a uni app because he was in no position to be making long-term contracts contacts to the vehicle's owner, Kiros's police department and went looking for food and water. What he found was an unappetizing looking rover slowly rolling around and looking at rocks. Both he and his pet perished on the Martian surface because he had not taken emergency supplies. Ambroise's last thought was, there's a lesson for you. Keros was over 1300 light minutes away. His signal had taken a week to get a to get there, and when it did, all emergency police cruisers were busy. Ambrose was long gone when an emergency ship was finally dispatched to help him. 
The rescue crew, consisting of three Kuroslings, not only found Ambroise's body, but several junk vehicles scattered around the surface of this red, barren planet. They began looking for the owners of these broken vehicles in order to give them a fine. They were in the neighborhood, after all, and not going to make any money off Ambroise. Their search led them to a larger blue planet nearby, a pretty sphere with brownish-white vapors, faded blue oceans, and bumpy land masses. They hoped their inhabitants would peacefully accept their fine and begin observing, began observing them to find out. Several humans saw a craft ascend, hover over O'Hare Airport, and quickly depart back into cloudy skies. These humans reported their experience to Chicago's police, who treated most for stress, gave them some pills, and advised seeing a psychiatrist. The Kurosling police were very confused because they were looking for black feathered creatures with yellow protruding mouths and skinny webbed feet. That's what the creature depicted on Opportunity looked like anyway. Surely, they reasoned, the picture on the craft must be one of the makers. Instead, they observed fleshy creatures of various colors, sizes, and body types operating major articles of transportation and equipment. They kept searching until finally finding the small black feathered creatures resembling the picture. These creatures were peacefully sitting upon bodies of water and not showing any signs of having built things that could now be half an astronomical unit AU away. So they turned their attentions back to the fleshy creatures and had a closer look. While these beings seemed to be rather silly, it was obvious they were the ones who could build things now littering the small red planet. So the Kuroslings held the conference with their planet's chief, and it was decided that contact should be made. If the blue planet beings were indeed responsible for the mess on Mars, they should damn well pay for having done so. A preparatory period of 10 years passed due to the fact that Kuroslings liked to fart around before doing anything major. During this period, they searched for the planet's seat of power. They found several seats and spent another five years researching which was best to contact. During the time farting around, they uh, occasionally dipped down into the atmosphere again, just to get people used to the idea that visitors would be stopping by. Finally, the Kuroslings settled on a small city along the banks of a large, picturesque river. The city looked friendly if you stayed away from the certain neighborhoods, and they figured that size might matter. Fewer creatures would inhabit a small city, so if things went badly, there would be less of an unpleasant breakup. The Kuroslings had been farting around longer than they realized before deciding the time was right for introductions. They had noted these creatures seemed more docile on warm, sunny days, and many of them could be seen lying around without much clothing on. The crew had also started thinking Earth girls were kind of cute. So on July 4th, they donned formal clothing and parked on a large patch of emerald green grass. This grass was known as the White House's South Lawn. The policemen began to park just after sunset to reduce planetary heat and limit their visibility. They expected the <coughs> pardon me. That was my Foster Brooks impersonation. <coughs> the policeman began to park just after sunset to reduce planetary heat and limit their visibility. They expected their arrival would cause great excitement among the populace, so wanted to limit gawking. After all, these beings had obviously gone in search of company that was finally going to drop by. The trio was surprised by a barrage of brightly colored explosions booming over the seat of power, though, and huge crowds on the park across from the colorless building. At first, they thought it was an, an attack, 
but quickly realized that none of the bursts occurred anywhere near them. So, since these magnificent explosions of color began shortly after their arrival, the cops decided that they were being welcomed. They felt genuinely moved. The United States president, Rhonda Durbin, had not been given a good day, having a good day. There were routine speeches about how great the country was, how God had favored them with riches and the benefits of freedom. Durbin had then laid a wreath, a, a wreath at America's Tomb of the Unknowns, while managing to keep her face from showing that Rhonda hated tombs, anyone's tomb. She praised those who had died for the cause of freedom. In truth, she thought dying for one's country was usually a waste. Over the course of 4,000 years, hundreds of thousands had died for great nations that had burned themselves out. Countries always yielded to greater powers sooner or later, usually after becoming horribly corrupt. It was inevitable, so hardly worth dying for over. After the wreath-laying ceremony, Durbin was whisked past many checkpoints back to her big white castle. Lunch, salad and a baked chicken breast, her weight gains were starting to show, was interrupted by her chief of staff, Bill Spector. Rhonda's stupid husband had done something, well, stupid. What now, the president asked with a heavy sigh, as if her extra weight were that of the world. Well, ma'am, Mr. Durbin was supervising the placement of the grill for his holiday barbecue out on the North Lawn. President Durbin indicated she knew of the barbecue and the lawn. There was a huge crowd on the mall, of course, and he decided to go say a few words to them. His aide tried to talk him out of it, but Mr. Durbin thought it was a great idea, being July 4th and all. The president gave a slight nod while taking a bite out of chicken to indicate she was listening. So Mr. Durbin went to the fence and said hello. Someone asked about the grill and party area, so he told them he'd be grilling hamburgers and hot dogs later. Um, this part's a bit embarrassing. Durbin felt for him, but also knew she'd have to hear it. It's okay, Bill. Tell me she said emp empathetically. Well, there was an absolute gorgeous young woman standing near him, and he, well, well, he, S Spectre closed his eyes, frowned, and shook his head. He asked her if she wanted to come inside for a special hot dog. Rhonda Durbin closed her eyes, too. She had to center herself, gain control so as not to release the yell clamoring for freedom. Somehow she kept her head, but when Rhonda's lids slid back open, her brown eyes betrayed anger. Her chief of staff looked nervous, but she suddenly seemed hopeful over a possible thought. I don't suppose he said it in a friendly, um, smiling kind of way, did he? The specter looked down at the table a moment. His frown answered a question, but he voiced it anyway. Well, he was smiling all right, but I'm told it was far more lascivious than friendly. Fuck. Rhonda spat out the word. She stabbed the chicken breast with her fork violently, used her knife to remove another slice and shoved the piece into her mouth. Rhonda's eyes focused like a laser on the far wall as she viciously chewed. Yes, ma'am. I believe that's what he had in mind. Specter hoped some humor might diffuse her anger. Her chewing slowed as the president looked sideways at him. For a moment, he simply held a breath. Then she laughed. So how bad is it? I mean, besides the immediate crowd, did any media hear him? Yes, ma'am. There were a few reporters doing pieces about visiting the White House on Independence Day, that sort of thing, and one of them had moved up the fence when Mr. Durbin came over. She had a camera on and caught every word. She, the president, knew that a woman would report this in an entirely different way than a man would. In a man's world, this was funny. 
and although serious, would be reported with a jocular chuckle. A woman, however, would report it with horror and indignation. The story's tone would become much more unpleasant. Yes, Madam President, the reporter was a woman. Her chief of staff knew what her question implied. Well, great. The president returned to her meal, but with much less vigor. Just great. And the um, object of my husband's attention, how did she react? I'm told that she was simply surprised at first, but when the reporter announced that she was with the Channel 7 News and shoved the microphone toward the woman, she began acting as if Mr. Durbin had unzipped his fly and whipped it out. Mrs. Durbin nodded with a ter rueful smile. Okay. First, we have to try to heal the um, injured party. Only a bleeding wound still gets attention after all. So see if she can get past her um, pain. The president clearly thought pain wasn't what the woman felt. She was probably flattered at first and now simply enjoying the attention. Ask her for a visit with me tonight, if possible. She then remembered the holiday. Dinner would be a ceremonial thing with many invited guests. Wait, she quickly thought through the scene and made a decision. Yes, tonight. She won't be news until tomorrow, so maybe we can bandage this before then. I'll just have a dessert at the celebration dinner. Dessert and drinks. She sh shook her head in disgust. Yes, ma'am. What kind of arrangements are you thinking of? She thought a moment. Let's do a small intimate dinner with her. What's her name? Chief of Spa Staff Specter consulted his notepad. Davis, ma'am. Jennifer Davis. Pretty name. Tell Chief uh, Sh Chef to serve lobster. Every woman loves lobster. I'll tell her things we women understand, like how stupid men are. Here she furrowed her brow and frowned at Specter. Indicating him simply for be, indicting him simply for being a member of the gender, but we can't let it ruin our nation's business and reputation. That sort of crap. Specter chuckled. Yes, ma'am. Sounds like a good plan. He stood up, started for the door, but got only a few paces when she added, "And tell my idiot husband that I'll see him in the m manor before dinner." Tell him that I won't be wanting a special hot dog either. Spectre fought down a complete guffaw. Yes, ma'am. As Spectre put a hand on the doorknob, President Durbin's secretary, Julia Corgan, knocked and opened it. Sorry to interrupt, madam, but Rhonda quickly cut her off. Again, Julia, call me ma'am. Madam makes me feel like a bordello owner. The president's secretary nodded for what must have been the hundredth time. Okay, ma'am, you're scheduled for a meeting with FEMA about Hurricane Martin. Fifteen minutes. President Durbin nodded. The hurricane had been massive and took out three cities in lower Ohio. Thanks. Specter left with Cor Corgan and President Durbin finished a few more bites before returning to the Oval Office. Few things could trump sex for the news world, especially sex that would embarrass a powerful figure. But there are a few. As it turned out, one of them was about to stop Jennifer Davis from becoming news anyway. President Durbin and Mrs. Davis were well into their lobster when alarms burst forth from deep within White House bowels. Chief of Sp Staff Specter had shown Davis into the family dining room, introduced them, and left the women to talk. Drinks were served, and they had a pleasant discussion in which the president explained that flirtation was a fault of her husband's, but a fault that didn't especially bother her so long as it stopped at flirtation, and it always did. She hoped that once Miss Davis understood that this comment was little more than a flirtation, and not a fully intended invitation to embarrass Lincoln's ghost, that she would feel a bit less offended. The president had guessed right. By the time their pre-dinner salad was gone, Ms. Davis felt overwhelmed, flattered, and important. 
Jennifer gasped when plates of lobster, red roasted potatoes and asparagus sautéed in olive oil were served. They had eaten their vegetables first and were very much enjoying the crustacean, fresh from Maine, when Secret Service agents came to collect them. They apologized for the intrusion, but something very large had been reported descending on the White House. The president and Jennifer Davis would have to be shown where the oft-rumored undisclosed location was. While being shepherded into an elevator that would take them many floors below the White House, the lead agent stopped and cocked his head. What? He spoke into a mic clipped to his sleeve. You're kidding. This better not be a joke, President Durbin said tightly. I've had enough of those today. What's going on? The agent simply looked at her for a moment. He gently brought his president back out of the elevator with a light touch of her arm. Take Ms. Davis into the shelter, he told the escorting agent. You'll be needed up here, Madam President. She accepted the Madam moniker in this vein because Ma'am President sounded dumb and Ms. President awkward. The escort nodded and President Durbin smiled reassuringly at her young guest as she stepped into the small compartment. Don't worry, dear. I'm sure it's nice down there and they'll take good care of you. President Durbin's expression then became worried but curious. What the hell's going on, Jim? James Broder, a tall, lean man in his early 50s, smiled at her use of his first name. His parents were what was known as Trekkies, fans of the TV show Star Trek, and had named him after the original captain of the starship Enterprise, James Tiberius Kirk. Broder had hated the name his entire life, but now felt it appropriate. We're being visited by a large saucer type of vehicle. It's of an odd metallic composition that our computers don't recognize. That's why our radar didn't notice it. Roof guards called this in. He felt in charge, sympathetic with the dawning incredulous expression on his president's face, while awed by what was obviously happening. Broder grinned wider at her. Broder grinned wider at her. I'm being told that at this moment, it's setting down on the South Lawn, Madam President. I think we're about to make contact with an alien species. She stared into his eyes for some sign of humor that he had rarely allowed. Instead, she saw only a worried amazement. President Durbin knew the question behind those eyes. What if these beings weren't friendly? Then we'd better get out of there, Jim. Then we'd better get out there, Jim, she said as they almost ran down the hall. After all this time, it'd be rude to keep them waiting. We'll see you in chapter four.